Um, thank you all for coming to my talk today. My name is Zachary Howard, and today I will be presenting my capstone project, where I simulated uh, two-dimensional ferromagnetic systems on a hexagonal lattice. Can you speak a little more loudly, please? Mm -hmm. um, so the goal of my simulation was to create real magnetic domains that look uh, like these up here. Um, those are some real samples that uh, we have pictures of. Um, so to start, I'm going to explain to you the model we chose um, as the groundwork for our Hamiltonian. Um, I'm then going to show you, or talk to you about something special we did, um, which is create a hexagonal lattice instead of uh, the conventional square lattice normally used in these simulations. Um, then I'm going to show you the first uh, real simulation we ran, which is where we made demagnetized state domain pattern. I'll talk to you about how we analyze them. I'll then show you uh, hysteresis loops um, we made from these uh, uh, from iterating a field over these demagnetized states. And while I'm explaining the next part, I'll show you a video of half of the hysteresis loop. If it plays. Um, so then once we um, doesn't look like it's play. Uh, once we got the hysteresis loops working, we made uh, what are called first order reversal curves. And um, I'll talk to you about how we analyze them. So these are just the pictures of our domain going through the applied field increasing. Uh, so the model we chose is called a five-fourth model. It has a general form, which you can see up here in this equation, where it has a uh, quartic polynomial minus a quadratic term. Um, the, uh, the phi term is, the con is a variable that represents our magnetization and we give it a continuous spectrum where if we use a form like this with uh, the coefficient of the quadratic term uh, set to two times its a, then we get a potential um, that looks like with a preferred minima of minus one and one. Um, this corresponds to, for our magnetization, uh, it preferring spin up or spin down. Um, so from the five-fourth model, we, uh, we added more terms to make the Hamiltonian more complex and account for more things. So we added um, an applied field term. Uh, the applied field term lets us create hysteresis loops. Uh, we added a random field term. The random field is what we use to break up the symmetry of the domains and account for things like impurities in the samples. Um, then we have probably the most important term, which is the interaction potential. Um, the interaction potential is what we use to account for all the nearest neighbors around each point um, on our lattices. And uh, in our simulation, we went out to 11 orders of nearest neighbors. <laughs> um, so the goal of our simulations for each iteration as it's running is to minimize the energy. And uh, in order to do that, um, the, we in the Hamiltonian, we try to minimize the energy. And in order to do that, the signs on the uh, applied field and the random field are negative, so that once the uh, domain site is lined up with the uh, um, applied field, it minimizes the energy. Um, Similarly, in the interaction potential, when the, uh, the domain sites being considered have the same sign as the oscillating uh, cosine, the potential is minimized. So in our, uh, in our Hamiltonian here, we have three parameters we can adjust. The first one is A, um, the second one is K, and the third one is the H random um, disorder. That, that lets us uh, play with the disorder of our system. Um, J0 is the term that normalizes the effect of uh, of the um, interaction potential terms, and uh, we use a dimensionless form here that we've taken from the two-sided papers. Um, so in our hexagonal lattice, uh, it was it was a change we originally made for two reasons. Um, the first of which was that in a hexagonal lattice, you can fit many more um, many more sites in per uh, area. So the effects of this would give us um, a much better a more realistic simulation. And uh, you can see the effects here. Uh, this is a graph of our interaction potential, uh, taking into account how many neighbors there are and how far away they are. And um, we want it to look like a cosine, because that's what the term in our potential was. And you can see here, it looks much more like an oscillation than this uh, jagged line, which was the, uh, square, uh, the square lattice. And the other reason was we originally thought that having a hexagonal lattice would make the bookkeeping a lot easier. but um, it actually had the opposite effect because instead of keeping track of one square lattice, we now had two. Um, because we made our lattice by taking, um, so lattice A, which would be one uh, square lattice, and lattice B would be another, and we staggered them and offset them. So we had to keep track of which point was in which lattice, and um, it actually made it a lot more complex, but we got better results. So, um, so 
So when we were making our demagnetized uh, state domain patterns, one <laughs> really useful tool for analyzing them uh, was the Fourier transform of the domain. And so we have our domain here, and the way we take the Fourier transform is for each row and column, we draw a line across it. Um, and that creates some kind of signal where each black and white uh, spot corresponds to a peak and a valley. Uh, so we get some signal like that. Uh, we take the Fourier transform, and we get a high and low uh, frequency solution, and plotting all of those for all the rows and columns gives us something like this. And when we perform a Fourier shift and put the zero frequency in the middle, we get a nice ring. Uh, that ring tells us a lot of information about the uh, domains very quickly, um, because the inverse of the radius of the ring tells us what the average domain spacing is. Um, the, uh, the, if the ring has a preferred bias, that tells us if the uh, domain itself has a preferred bias and what direction the lines go. Um, and the radius of the, the, um, the ring part itself, just the thickness of this, is inversely proportional to the uh, correlation length, which is how many domain lines next to each other are lined up. Um, so here are our uh, first uh, parameter values I'll show you. These are just the interesting cases for K. We ran it for many more values. But um, so for low values of K, we had these like unphysical amoeba-like amoeba-like things um, with uh, this weird speckle pattern in them. Um, you can see looking at the Fourier transform that uh, talking about things like the radius of the ring and the correlation length aren't really useful because it's just a small sphere. Um, so moving on to k equals 1.0, th these made beautiful labyrinthy domains that we uh, we really like. These you can see that the the ring has no preferred <coughs> orientation at all. It um it spread out from the circle it was. Um, so we like these pictures a lot. Um, moving to k equals 1.5. So for large values, you see that uh, the ring uh, gets much bigger. Um, this corresponds to domains getting tight, more tightly packed. And you can see that when you compare these two. Uh, the blacks are much closer together, the much closer together. Um, and, uh, but you can see here that there's definitely a preferred orientation horizontally and diagonally in this direction. I don't know if you can see that. Um, and you can see that in the Fourier transform by there being two preferred locations. Um, so uh, we also looked at the radius of all the different k values we looked at. And um, when we took the inverse of the radius, this gave us the domain spacing, like I mentioned before. Uh, it followed a power law. Um, we're not quite sure why it followed the power law. We didn't get to investigate that this quarter, but um, it's something we're still very interested in looking into. Um, the next uh, parameter we looked at was A. Um, the effects of A weren't as noticeable as K. Um, it just kind of blurred the domains. Uh, you can't really tell looking at these, um, but this is much more ordered than this is. And this can be seen in the Fourier transform, because in this one here, you have uh, peaks. There's some red in there and everything. That means it's, there's a higher intensity. Um, here, it kind of blurs into blue into the background, and you can't, it's not as uh, distinguished. Um, so once we, uh, once we got the demagnetized domains working, uh, we moved on to characterizing. Uh, we modified our program so it made hysteresis loops, and we moved on to characterizing them. Um, two reasons for doing this, the first of which is uh, that we wanted to know what kind of hysteresis loops we could simulate, which corresponds to what kind of objects we could simulate. Um, the other reason is uh, we were contacted by an external collaborator who was working on research in symmetry um, in domains. And so what he's doing is looking at the magnetic x-ray scattering images, you can see one here, and he's rotating them. Um, and what he's doing is he's rotating them different angles, which um, different angles and looking at different radii within the, uh, the ring itself and looking for symmetry there. And when these counts dip down here, uh, that signifies that there is no symmetry, but when they pop up, there is symmetry. Um, so he asked us to try to recreate this big hysteresis loop here and uh, sent him the data. Um, so we started by looking at the effects of varying K on our uh, hysteresis loops. And starting at low values, we get very hard history because it's, you can see it's, it's a box. Um, huge area inside of it. Um, increasing K to 1.1 changed the uh, morphology of the, uh, of the loop from a very hard loop to more of a hybrid, where um, it's kind of a combination between a very hard and thin loop, or, or very hard and soft loop. Um, uh, 
It also pushed the nucleation points closer to zero, um, increasing K further, uh, pushed it further into this hybrid morphology, and um, uh, yeah, we like point. We like values around 1.1 because we're interested in making uh, graphs that look like what our collaborator sounds. Uh, the next value we looked at was sigma. This is our disorder parameter, disorder parameter or H applied from before. Um, you can see here the low values of sigma. Um, the domains aren't as hard as for low values of K, but um, they're definitely hard. They have sharp drops and uh, um, yeah. And then um, increasing sigma from 0.4 to 1.8, uh, we start to get, again, we move into this hybrid morphology we wanted to look at. Um, uh, so we continued increasing. Um, we get to 4.8, and the loop starts to become softer. It's not, it's not a soft loop yet, but it still is um, it's still shifting that way. Um, so yeah. The next variable, or the final parameter we looked at was our variable A. Um, a didn't have as pronounced of an effect on the um, on the domains as uh, or on the hysteresis loops as sigma and k did, but the effect is extremely useful because it you can see it preserves it doesn't perfectly preserve the morphology of the domains, but um, it shifts the nucleation sites of the hysteresis loops um, as it increases it pushes them out. So we were able to um, control where our domains started nucleating by uh, playing around with it. So. Um, combining these, I have the video again, so you can see it much better this time, and I'll explain it. Uh, so these were the final parameters we chose for our simulation uh, to send our collaborator. Um, so we see here we're at the black saturation, uh, the field starting at the magnetization right now is at minus one. And when I hit play, hopefully it'll just go. Now we got to wait again. Um, so it starts nucleating. The white cells pop out of the black background. Uh, the white cells then start to form. Um, white lines with each other. Uh, the white then start to dominate, and the black lines that formed as a result start to break up, turn into black cells, and then it uh, goes into the black saturation, or the white saturation. Uh, so this is the final hysteresis loop we made. Um, and you can see it, it actually it looks very good compared to the one that you want us to make. So we're pretty good about, happy about that. We're going to send it to um, the next bit of analysis we did are what are called first order reversal curves um, and the excursions that result from them. So a first order reversal curve is when uh, you start by, when you're tracing out your main hysteresis loop, you move the field one way, all the way up, and then it gets here and you start going back the other way, and when you're going the other way, you turn around at some point. And when you have this hybrid morphology that we've been, uh, that we've been looking into, you can um, you can actually exit the main hysteresis loop. Um, and this, was, this is one thing that was thought to be impossible until it was shown experimentally recently. Um, so we can simulate this. Uh, so we wanted to figure out why it happens. And um, our original theory is that it happens because um, of, the, of a certain aspect of the topology of the domain patterns. And that is that um, during the excursion, there are more cells, um, more very small um, lines above the saturation it's moving to. And um, we think that that causes the excursion because it's, it takes more energy. Um, to f it takes energy to flip the cells from um, one to the other. And if you have a domain full of cells, you have more surface area that the applied field has to then shift to the other color. So to do this, I had to write an analysis software that would uh, go through the domain to classify each um, each object above the background is either a line or a cell. And um, an example of the program can be seen here, where it started on some random point in here that was a white point and traced out everything connected to it. So everything blue here is connected to the original point. Um, so using that, uh, we were able to make a curve that looks like this um, of our original excursion here. So basically, at point, so it starts at minus 8 again and it iterates until point one, um, where it starts to, the black background starts to break up, white starts popping up. So the, the black, you, the, the gigantic black background starts to form into cells. Um, and it keeps increasing until point two when it's at its maximum. Um, and then the black cells start to disappear into the white background. Um, 
the field starts from the other way, and then at point three it starts mutilating the other way. Black cells pop out of the, the white background. Uh, that corresponds to this original rise right here. Um, that rise then starts decreasing because um, the black cells form black lines. Um, here the, the field turns around at minus 1.8, it starts going the other way. Uh, originally, right, right at this turn point, it frustrates the domain. The domain stays relatively constant and not changing for um, many applied field values until the black lines that had formed start to turn back into cells. You can see here that actually during the reversal portion of the trip, we have more cells um, than we have uh, than we had on the main uh, portion of the trip. So um, this uh, this strengthens our hypothesis. We are happy. It looks like uh, the cells uh, did what we thought they would do. Um, so we tried a different value of a more uh, a more hybrid uh, hysteresis loop, and uh, so we just changed the k value to 1.2 here. Um, and as you can see, we have a similar uh, pattern here where uh, from 1 to 2 we get our nucleation cells form um, or lines break up, cells form, they start to decay off, white saturation except this time for k equals 1.2 we have a massive spike in, um, in the black cells that form out of the white saturation. Um, this gives us many more cells on the reversal uh, excursion part of the, on the reversal part of the trip um, and this creates big differential here and creates a larger excursion than we had before. Um, the, the excursion isn't huge, but it is larger than we had before. Um, uh, one interesting thing to note about this um, is that for every point where we have an excursion, um, I, say this point right here, we have the same exact magnetization of 0.5 and applied field 6. Or, no, it's not actually, it's somewhere in the middle. Um, but they have the same magnetization, same applied field, so the, only, so the only thing different is the, to, the topology of it, and the cell count and the line count. Um, a quick note is the reason the line count isn't shown is it's a little difficult to discern what's going on because one line could mean one massive structure, or one line could mean lots of cells and one actual line. So we haven't quite figured out how to display that yet. Um, so in the future, we're going to investigate that power law I showed you before. Um, uh, yeah, we're going to investigate the power law due to the domain spacing. Um, we also didn't examine the effects of the disorder on the correlation length, um, which is something we want to look into. Um, and we're also going to look to form a quantitative link between cell count and excursion area instead of just the qualitative link we see from looking at cell counts. Um, I'd like to thank my primary mentor, Dr. Pierce, for endless guidance in this, Dr. Anderson, the capstone mentor, Dr. Stephen Caban, who is our external collaborator, the RIT School of Physics and Astronomy for giving me this opportunity, uh, the RIT Research Computing Cluster for letting me run my simulations, um, and my girlfriend Jessica Beider for allowing me to skip Valentine's Day to practice my presentation. <laughs> uh, thank you. doesn't like going past movies. Type in the type in the slide. This one? Yeah, this one. Have you tried measuring either some sort of orientational order parameter or structure factor from these? Because that would be a quantitative way of comparing. Um I mean you have the Fourier transform, so you can easily write measures of structure factors. What do you mean by structure factor? What do you mean by structure factor? So, I guess, do you, have you read about the radial distribution? It's essentially the degree of order in a system. So if you had completely crystalline order, a, let's say a hexagonal lattice like you started with, you will get graph peaks which look, peaks which look like a hexagonal lattice, like sharp peaks. If you have completely disordered system, you will have a proper ring. And then if you have something in between, it will be something in between a ring and then this sharp peak. It's actually it's and then you can make actually a quantitative measurement from that of you know what your structure factor is. You can calculate that from you know, your PA transform. So yeah, when, so when in this case it would be a soft yeah. So you, that would be a quantitative way 
of way of seeing how much order there is because this one, the one to the right, has some string like order, right? Mm -hmm. It's so it has more order than the ones that you have to yep. the left. So that would be one nice addition to you know, what you're working. Some with. of the uh, when when we were looking at different parameters this quarter, when we made um, different uh, demagnetized state patterns, we actually did get hexagonal uh, Fourier mm -hmm. transforms. So. And I had one more question. The hysteresis loops that you are looking at, again, you are trying to characterize those things, mm -hmm. right? Have you looked at the area under a hysteresis loop as a function of, you know, different parameters that you are varying? Um, no, but that's kind of that's kind of what we were looking at because we were trying to make uh, the hard loops, uh, soft loops, and then the like kind of in the middle. So we didn't explicitly calculate area, but that's I guess qualitatively what we were looking at. Yeah, but that would again be a quantitative way of characterizing. Yeah. It's nice to have quantitative things in addition. Yeah. Uh, Scott? Um, did you investigate the system size dependence of these things? Um, from what, I didn't explicitly investigate it, but from what we did look at, it didn't really have that big of an effect besides making the domains look much better. I mean, history systems are pretty sensitive to, to your system size, especially when you're getting these transitions where it looks like your entire system is flipping or a large fraction of your system. Uh, the history of loops I did look at didn't depend on size. That these much. are periodic boundary conditions. Yes. Uh, yeah. You can see the periodic boundary sure. conditions in the uh, in the domain tracing program when it goes off the left side and wraps back onto the right. There. Right there. Mark. I wrote them. Michael? This is probably way too picky. Uh, go, just go back to your, uh, one of your, I think it was your initial slide on the Fourier transform. I just want to make sure I'm not missing anything. Fantastic. Oh, 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 yeah, so, uh, the picture on the, the upper left hand picture. Yeah. Should those amplitudes be all over the place? Or just uh, this is actually just an example. I mean, it's not, it, it's not actually a line. Um, imagine it would go between one and minus one. And it, we, the the picture is actually scaled, so it's not just black and white. Uh, there would be some gray in there. Um, gray is so the points in the very middle of the domains, like like in the middle here, would be black. They would have a grayscale value of two hundred fifty five. Um, whereas the points closer to the border would be somewhere between um, zero and two hundred fifty. So um, that would, I guess, the signal would be between zero and two fifty. Sure. Uh, I think a couple slides earlier, you had all your equations. Uh, there was one with, yeah, okay, that one. Uh, so you have cosine k r, and then you have cosine k. Um, so this I'm for, just worried about units. Yeah, um, to calculate um, J0 here, um, this is just the condition it gives us for calculating it. Um, in terms of units, uh, we, we kind of jumped into it with the equations we found in those two papers. I mean, is, is the R non-dimensionalized? Um, yes, I believe, yes. So that, that would that answer it then. So R doesn't have any dimensions. Because it's, it's based off the number of uh, lattice sites. Okay. Other questions? Thank you.